So good afternoon, folks, and thanks for being here. Um, this is a little different setting than our other town halls. We're usually downstairs, a little bit more space. This is a little bit more intimate and a get to know your neighbor type of a space. But uh, I appreciate you being here. Many of you know me, uh, Daryl DeWald. I serve as the chancellor of this campus, and I'm also the vice president of health sciences for Washington State University. So a little bit of a um, format today. I'm going to go ahead and, and do a brief introduction, but what I'd like to do is highlight, and I will bounce in and out of different spaces, the three colleges and some of the great things that are going on. I'll finish with talking a little bit about our strategic planning. We do have the opportunity to probably spend 30 minutes in this presentation and 30 minutes in questions. And uh, there is an opportunity because we have leadership here from all the colleges, the health sciences, that there may be questions that you want to ask of individuals. So it's just a little bit of a heads up. So before we do get started, what I'd like to do is uh, to acknowledge the land on which WSU sits and occupies as the traditional homelands of the Spokane tribe of Indians. The university expresses its deepest respect for and gratitude towards these original and current caretakers of the region. As an academic community, we acknowledge our responsibility to establish and maintain relationships with these tribes and native peoples in support of their tribal sovereignty and the inclusion of their voices in our teaching, our research, and our programming. So, we have a really cool system where we have community-based health sciences, three colleges that are statewide colleges. These colleges are all committed to educational sustainability, educational su expansion, research sustainability and expansion, and then partnerships, but with, both with internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. So. I'd like to kick things off by sharing a few wins from the statewide colleges this year. But before I begin, I wish to extend my thanks to each of you for your hard work and your commitment to WSU and the health sciences. These highlights only scratch the surface of the incredible work being done by all of you. You're impacting thousands of lives through your commitment to our students and our community. Our colleges continue to adapt, innovate, and work hard to meet challenges head on while keeping ever focused on a commitment to preparing our next generation of health professionals to succeed in a quickly changing environment. I want to be very clear. Your work matters. You are making a difference in our future as an institution and as a society is bright in part because of what you do. So what I'd like to do is to recognize the colleges. I'm going to start with our College of Medicine. <clears throat> as you'll see, I'm going to hit different highlights as we go through the different colleges. <clears throat> and this is not a one and done for our College of Medicine, but you will see we're going to touch on what all of you are doing. So Dr. Record was appointed as Dean of the College of Medicine. And as the college continues to navigate accreditation and build sustainable programs, I'm grateful to his leader, for his leadership and the leadership of the college. A lot of change over time. But what we've seen is the leadership has not only uh, stayed intact, but they've been empowered to commit to mission and vision. And I appreciate that deeply. So this year marks the college's seventh entering MD class. And that's worth celebrating, isn't it? Yeah, pretty cool. You know what's also worth celebrating is that the graduates of this program will move into independent practice this summer. So you will see, Coug yes, thank you. <laughs> Where we have Coug nurses and pharmacists across the state in practice, what we will see is we will have Coug docs serving not only this state but beyond uh, coming this this summer. They've already been doing that in their residency programs, but we will see them as independent practitioners. Make sure and go see a Coug doc. So this spring, the College of Medicine celebrated the launch 
of its pediatric residency program, which is a partnership, hard won, hard fought, a lot of effort, between Providence Sacred Heart Children's Hospital with the support of generous gifts from the Community Cancer Fund and Primera. A shout out to those, including people like Nancy, who made that happen. Because in the absence of over eight and a half million dollars of commitment, those programs will not exist. There are a number of people in this community who stepped up. They wanted this program to occur for over 20 years. The WSU Elsinos Floyd College of Medicine made this happen. So congrats there. And just as a reminder, this is the first pediatrics residency on the east side of the state, east of the Cascades. And it's a reflection of the can-do attitude of folks. I'll talk more about some of the other programs in medicine in just a moment. Let's go ahead and look at nursing. Oop, hang on. Did I skip over? Okay. So I'll go ahead and go to the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical <laughs> Sciences. <clears throat> I want to thank Mark Lead for his leadership these past years. Many of you recognize that we have these three deans that have come in during the pandemic. Some of them came in when we were all at a distance, and they came into programs that were doing well but need a lot of attention. So we're seeing significant enrollment recovery thanks to the hard work of the pharmacy team. Our College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical um, Sciences has also launched two programs to address workforce needs and establish pathways into health profession programs. Not a day goes by that I don't hear something positive about the BS in pharmaceutical and medical sciences and the opportunities. We had a reach out from the Hutch today because they're interested in this program, but you can, you see just the growing enthusiasm about this program and the potential to fill workforce needs. So thank you to the pharmacy team. Another is the Psych and PharmD program. A lot of you had the insight, including Mark, to recognize that psychology is a uh, high enrollment program down in a college that I used to serve with, and they graduate hundreds of students. Many of those students don't have an opportunity to move into a profession. So Mark has partnered, and many of you in pharmacy have partnered with a psychology team down in Pullman to develop a three plus four program intended to support a pathway to becoming a psychiatric pharmacist and addressing workforce work for shortages in mental health. So these programs are examples of innovative and responsive solutions coming from our health sciences teams. And they are thanks to your hard work. The BS program, for example, is requiring staff and faculty in the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences to develop entirely new systems to support its first ever undergraduate program. This is no small lift on the part of our student support teams and our recruitment teams, our faculty and our program administration. <clears throat> so the College of Nursing, I wish to thank Dean Coithan for continued leadership as she and her team have worked to build a vision for the College of Nursing that strengthens its presence both here in Spokane and statewide. And this is also no small effort. I want to acknowledge all of those who have played a role in this. As many of you know, there's been the development of departments in the College of Nursing for the first time in its history. Its 50-year history was intercollegiate, and there was a, um, a separation where it became the WSU nursing program. But in that time, they've operated as well as they could without departmental structures. I think this is really wise on the part of Dean Coithan and colleagues to move in to the departmental structures. That helps them because like our other two professional colleges, the College of Nursing is uh, going to have accreditation review in 2024. They've been working on strategic planning and preparing for the next site visit. The College of Nursing continues to work to strengthen comprehensive support for its statewide programs. And just a reminder, it is the largest nursing program in the state of Washington. Additionally, they are working toward the development and launch of several new degree programs. <clears throat> so some of the other programs that are cross-cutting with our departments and our colleges uh, include the Bachelor in Public Health. This is a collaboration 
with the College of Veterinary Medicine, where there will be a focal activity in infectious diseases uh, that will be in the, on the Pullman campus with Vet Med, but also there will be a behavioral health um, emphasis here in the College of Medicine uh, on our campus, but statewide. This is a good time to just highlight the fact that um, our leadership works very well with colleagues in Pullman and across the state. And in fact, an example of that was yesterday when we had a number of state representatives here and Dean Dory Borgeson was here and she spoke into the fact that our three colleges work very well. These are professional colleges that do face different challenges than some of the other colleges in our system. So the other is a bachelor's and master's degree in social work. And this is a program, and most of you know this, but any of the degree programs must be housed within a college. And so the, the bachelor's and master's program will be housed academically in the College of Nursing, but it will be launched from the Tri-Cities campus. Uh, we're looking into the future to see what the demands and needs will be for that program. There was a consortium effort that went to the state to get funding for these programs, and the same with public health. So we are in process of supporting and developing these new degree programs. So some of the capital projects that I wanted to mention, how many of you were able to go to the medicine building opening? Okay, all right, let's just say it. Wasn't that cool? <laughs> okay, that was super cool for a college that bootstrapped up and was in I think it's actually, I've said seven different buildings, but I think it's nine different buildings. Um, it was really such an incredible opportunity to see this team work together. And what happened there is we recognized the needs when we did a master plan um, back in 2018, 17 and 18, and that drew from previous master plans that we really needed housing for our College of Medicine. We had told the state that we could start this great college without really having siting for it, but I think it put the college in a disadvantaged place because it didn't allow the students as much as we would like to see for them to develop as cohorts, for them to work together. Then you throw in that pandemic thing and it got really, really challenging. So we pivoted a little bit in our capital planning and we went back to the state and we asked for $15 million. The state willingly um, provided those funds. And then what we've seen with the hard work of some of our development officers, we've seen that other people wanted to contribute to that space and we're still seeing people interested in that. So that medicine building is, and I hope everybody's been over there. If you haven't, please go visit. But that's about bringing students together and allowing them to develop and grow as teams to, to work in collaborative spaces and to have the student success. It's really encouraging for me. I occasionally will just walk over and interact with folks. But I want to thank uh, many of you who really leaned in heavily to develop that space for our students. So the next uh, building that I wanted to talk about is one that we received initial funding from the state. We're calling it the Team Health Education Building. Our boss has made it clear that he doesn't really like that name, and I believe he mentioned it. <clears throat> That's fine. This is about a interprofessional experiential uh, educational building. What we are doing is we're looking at the programming and for the building and what will happen there, and it's about bringing the different learners together in simulation spaces, but it's way beyond that. What we have found is that we have external stakeholders very interested. All three of the deans, many of you, work closely with the health system leadership. And the health systems have indicated that they are very interested in speaking into the programming of this team health education building. It also represents a different paradigm in regard to the way that we get funding for the buildings. In the past, and as a dean, the way that I would do it is I would put my, my um, listed building in, I would put it into a queue, and then you'd watch it be number 27. Next year, it'd work its way up to about number 17, then it'd get up to 15, and then something bizarre would happen and move back to 30. And where I'm playing, I'm not. So we're doing this differently now, and President Schultz has made it very clear 
that what he wants is to see us use a model where we go after philanthropic support and partnership support as well as what the state provides. And the College of Engineering has done this well. We see the beginnings of this with the medicine building, but all of the leadership understands that we will be working hard to um, have that philanthropic support. What it actually represents for us is the way of doing. It's how we operate. We don't do things alone. These colleges are about community engaged, community serving, community based, and they are about partnership. We go to, we don't expect for folks to come to us. So this is a prime opportunity for us to live that out by working with, whether it be businesses or health systems who want to contribute and be part of this. Team Health might, and we're getting input, it might have a clinic associated with it. It will very likely have the interprofessional uh, simulation space, but it will also have spaces that we're hoping will be for clinical studies. So these are things that we're thinking about with that building. The next is the future biosciences building. As many of you know, we had at the top of our queue a building that was similar to the pharmaceutical and biomedical sciences building. That is still in the queue and it's fairly high. But what we did is the team health and medicine building were put in the system <clears throat> in the queue higher, but we still have that one in our queue and we will push for that because we are struggling with, among many things, vivarium space for our researchers and lab space for our researchers. We continue to try to grow sustainably, but to do that, we will need a larger footprint. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about the research that is uh, coming out of these three colleges. So number one, it's expanding and increasing. So this is about 50% more than seven or eight years ago. And what this is, is it's a beautiful recognition of the quality of work being done by the faculty and staff in the health sciences. So if you look at these numbers and the grants and awards for FY23 are over 40 million. They did dip a little bit during the pandemic, but we're now back and we're headed back up. Then the expenditures, and I wanna point out something. These are direct expenditures. If we calculate these the way that WSU does appropriately, and we probably should, our expenditures are actually between 50 and $60 million now per year. So think about that for a second. That actually puts this organization on the pathway in the future if they were gonna be considered with the education and the research actually to be an R1 institution because of the great work that is going here. So when you look at the dollars, you would say, okay, well, those are, those are great, but it's really the impact of the work. Now we put some numbers up here and the numbers are debatable because they can be uh, presented in different ways. But let me point something out. The College of Medicine uh, out of approximately 160 medical schools in our nation is already at about 110. But in terms of community-based schools, and we've talked with John Roll about this, already in the top 10. Sit with that for a second and think about that so far exceeds our promise to the state and our expectation, but it represents the incredible work of the people who are, who are here. Our College of Nursing, there's two different reports. One puts them at number 10, but trying to be conservative. Uh, another puts it 13. Let me point something out. Across our nation, more than 2,000 schools of nursing. Among those that receive NIH funding, which is a small subset of those, we're already in the top 15. Again, that's a reflection of the innovative and committed work, the hard work of our College of Nursing team. There are folks in here who also serve in leadership, who have NIH funding, who they step up and they understand that it's not only that they serve as a leader, but they continue the good work that they've done as a researcher. There are people in the room who have two NIH R01s, the gold standard for success, and they're in the College of Nursing. So then you look at the College of Pharmacy, and Mark says we need to do better, but I gotta tell you, clipping 
at over 10 million bucks a year in terms of expenditures is really remarkable. And this puts them in the top quartile in terms of the colleges of pharmacy. So these are actually uh, pretty impressive. But what's impressive to me is actually the focus areas of the research. So I'm going to go ahead and read just a little bit so that you can sit with me on this. So improving outcomes for people in permanent supportive housing. Studying how e-health programs can help people with chronic pain reduce their op opioid medications and pain intensity. Developing safer drug dosing standards for children and other populations that are underrepresented in clinical drug trials. Creating a lab for testing home health technologies that can improve health outcomes and quality of life for adults with chronic addictions. Developing training to help police officers recognize their implicit bias. And finally, conducting studies that demonstrate the effectiveness of contingency management. This has resulted in changes to Washington state policy to provide Medicaid coverage to support intervention to treat stimulant drug addiction. Washington is the second state in the nation to do this. So when you look at these research areas and you consider those as just highlights and then the broader range of research activities, community-based, community-serving, distributed across the state and the region, engaging with and partnerships with tribal nations to understand and support in partnership with the tribal nations how we can serve them, medically underserved populations, rural and urban populations. So this is a team that draws from a commitment to others to do this research that will have impact, not only um, in real time, but in the long term. So what I wanted to talk about uh, finally, and then we'll, we'll take some questions, is where we are in regard to strategic planning. So this summer, our campus leadership um, had, a, had a team retreat. Um, we, we refer to these things as retreat. Nobody retreats. You're working your rear off to do a lot of work. But what we did is we got together and, and we talked about um, something that they have committed to and they're doing. Independent quality and success and looking for collaboration and the kind of the um, opportunities across the disciplines. We have to have an excellent College of Medicine, an excellent College of Nursing, and an outstanding College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. That has to happen. Then when you have that in place, you look for the opportunities to tether, to collaborate, to coordinate, and then to partner with each other. So what we're doing is we're looking at the opportunities for the health sciences to further support that. What we will do is we'll have two different strategic plans, and we're working on this, and we're getting input in real time about the need to modify this. But the strategic plan for, will be for WSU Spokane, and then we will have a second one that is for WSU Health Sciences. It gives me an opportunity to point something out. Of the non-Pullman campuses, and I don't like that nomenclature, let's call it the Spokane campus, you need to think about that this is the only other campus where colleges are headquartered, where the deans and the leadership teams of those colleges are on this campus. But all three of those colleges are statewide. Yeah, bless you. And those statewide commitments are different than some of our other campuses that they have a responsibility in their locality and they serve those municipalities or regions very well. But all of you bear a responsibility for what we do in Spokane, but what we do across the state. Think of it this way too. Many of you manage the students in their clinical placements and affiliations across the state, hundreds and hundreds. At times there may be as many as a thousand of your learners out across the state. Think about a map of the state of Washington. 
and put a pinpoint every place that those students are. It is basically a neural network across the state. It's similar to what Extension does, but in many ways, even more because of the students that are there and your commitment to supporting the students in those environments. It's also where our students are our ambassadors. Those who you are investing in, those who are you, you are helping, they represent the best of who we are across the state of Washington. Sometimes there's a little bit of confusion among some of our colleagues when they just think about their campuses and what their responsibilities are. But I want to, in real time, acknowledge that you commit not just to what is happening in Spokane in these three statewide colleges headquartered here, but you commit to what is going on across the state. So didn't mean to beat that to death, but there you go. So <clears throat> I did want to point out some of the um, highlights of our strategic plan. So first is student success and support, and this addresses how we foster an environment for student-centered learning and growth that prepares them to succeed both in the classroom and in their field of graduation. We are not primary in this, but we are secondary. We take secondary very important. The colleges are primary, but we have to support what the colleges are doing. Research partnerships and infrastructure. This sets forth strategies to support the growth of research, not only on our campus, but in the distributed manner that we do it across the state, the region, and actually the nation. Next is community engagement and clinical partnerships. Again, with the focus on what happens in the college, but part of my job is to help manifest clinical partnerships, agreements that take place out across the state. And so while I'm supporting, it's important for me to commit to supporting what's happening in the colleges. And then organizational capacity and effectiveness. This one gives me a chance to, I'm sorry for the smirkage, but our campus has not yet been um, resourced to fully support these three large and growing professional colleges. And we still don't have sufficient personnel and colleagues to do this the way that we need to by our mission and we're expected to. So I just want to make it clear that we are working toward that goal, but that is a long game. So finally, um, our campus strategic plan is just one piece of a larger vision for the WSU Health Sciences. It must coordinate and support the strategic plans from the colleges. And beginning this spring, we'll begin to craft a strategic plan that will take this vision and begin to put it into action. Again, hear me, this is what the colleges are already doing. So we need to come along and support that. The plan will emphasize investment in our statewide programs. It will identify ways that we can ensure our students, faculty, and staff across the state are connected to and supported by their colleges. Our team and I have been traveling the state, working to identify members of our system leadership who can also serve as liaisons because the colleges have shouldered a lot of that on their own and they've done the hard work. But we are here to support that effort as well. Um, so I'd like to ask that as opportunities emerge to please give voice to what you envision as the future of WSU Health Sciences. And I'm going to end with this, and please bear with me, because these are heartfelt, but I'm going to read it. So I want to say thank you to each of you for your work and your commitment in investing in others. This is no small thing. It takes time, energy, and resilience. Things are deeply impactful, but not always immediately seen in what you do. What I've shared today is just a tiny portion of the incredible things that you have done even over the last year. So I wish to wrap up by acknowledging that your work matters and that you do make a difference. You chose to come to WSU and stay at WSU because you want to help make the world a better place. You develop programs to help our students hone their skills and create a sense of community. You welcome prospective students to campus and tour them 
and our beautiful facilities. You help maintain our grounds, our labs, our buildings, and you are on call to help keep our community safe. You teach our students persistence and you mentor them when they need help and they do need help. You see the potential that they have to be incredible health professionals that they are destined to be. You stay up late grading. You stay up late taking care of people. You stay up late writing proposals. You spend time in a lab identifying ways to help people you will never meet have healthier lives. You serve those who report to you and you help them take on new challenges and be successful. You do what you do because you care. The drive to teach, to learn, to grow, and to help others grow. The drive to do research and to get the funding necessary to discover innovative and transformative solutions to health challenges. But you do it because you want to invest in other people. And through that, you are literally impacting thousands of lives every day. I want to acknowledge that I see you, and it is both humbling and inspiring. When I go out to meet with donors, community leaders, and members of the legislature, including yesterday, they tell me how proud they are of what you do. So thanks for taking a few minutes with me. Thanks for letting me ramble a little bit. I've learned one thing, and with the, the career that I've had and with the challenges that all of us have right now, it's just better to be authentic. So I hope you can hear some of the last part of what I said. With that, I'm gonna stop. We do have some questions that were forwarded, and I'll see if I can address those, and we'll go through a few, and then we'll get to some questions. This is kind of an intimate group to uh, have questions, so why don't you get us started, please, if you would, Chantel. Yeah, thank you so much, Daryl. Um, so we had a couple questions that were submitted in advance, so we'll work through some of those first, and then we'll open up the floor for other questions from the group, but we did want to make sure we addressed a couple specific things that emerged from the questions that were submitted. So something that's kind of top of mind right now, Daryl, for folks is what's Spokane's plan to support employee retention and some of our long-term staffing needs that we have right now? Yeah, so this is, this is a very difficult time because we're seeing many things transform in the workforce. So what I do want to do is call out a few of the things that some of us as leaders have, have done. So we do partner with our government relations team pretty closely. We partner with the president's office and the provost's office. So this is why, and it took, um, how many of you are in nursing? <laughs> so yeah, you'll know this, it took forever asking for to have some um, salary adjustments addressed in nursing. But we kept and we persisted in that. We went to the state and we asked for cost of living adjustment. Kirk Schultz will admit to you this is very difficult because in the past what has happened is the state would approve cost of living adjustments. And they would say, we will give you 50 or 60 or 70% of the money, you have to come up with the rest of this. The problem is where does that money come from? It usually comes from tuition. So the students bear a lot of that responsibility. That's not a best practices model. Nonetheless, we went to the state, we asked for funding. We got general cost of living adjustments that were uh, implemented in October and there will be another one uh, for classified and AP colleagues um, that will come out in 2025. In addition to that, um, in terms of recruitment and retention, so retention is also going to be, in some cases, a salary issue. But what I, what I think this allows me to address is that um, it's more than just the compensation. It's the environment that you all commit to in regard to your environments of respect, a culture of building sustainably, and people building together. And there's something about that that can glue folks together. It's not for everybody. So we're trying on, on the um, compensation space and we will continue to do that. We did finally get nursing to 50th percentile. The way that that worked out is we went to uh, the central leadership and we asked them. They committed temporary funding. Then we went to the state. 
that allowed for us to go ahead and compensate staff and faculty at 50th percentile. That's still not where we should be. Our College of Nursing should be at least on average at 75th percentile. This is very similar to what Mark and Jim are faced with and many of you experience. We need to actually adjust the compensation for the colleagues in those two colleges as well. So, yep. Okay, so this is similar and related. Um, talk to us about where the campus is standing in terms of its budget. In the next two Your hours. Your favorite topic. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think many of you have observed um, and been involved in the process of the budget uh, model planning. Okay, we have a number of colleagues who, who have been involved. So the last couple years, we have looked at a model and worked with a consultant, Huron, who came on board and they were going to help us to model a hybrid RCM model. Does everybody know RCM, what that is? So RCM is, thank you for some honesty, responsibility-centered management. And what that means, and it's usually very effective for tuition-driven institutions. Those institutions that rely on the tuition from <clears throat> their students to pay for operations and salaries and facilities. So we were going to develop a hybrid RCM model, meaning we would retain some of the base funding, but then we would have some of this being responsibility-centered management. Uh, another word for this is activity-based budgeting. But this model applied across our system is not highly effective for professional programs, and I'm just going to say that. However, I want to stop for a second. I want you to, to understand clearly. These three colleges in the health sciences actually generate more revenue than we do um, have expenditures. Okay, so sit with that for a minute. You are often, you'll be told you're very expensive, medicine, pharmacy, nursing, very expensive. They are. But they actually, these colleges and the health sciences generate more revenue than we have in terms of expenses. Having said that, we have to rely on services, and some of those services come from Pullman. So we were trying to define a model that would work for these colleges as well as the colleges in Pullman. What I think happened is that when uh, Leslie Brunelli came on board, and she has deep expertise, she's been in the South Carolina system, and there they have multiple medical schools. They, they have a very complex system. She was then in Denver, and she recognized that right now with our workday reporting, yeah, Nancy, would you get that, please? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> she recognized that we don't have currently the ability to track our expenditures and revenues in a budget model. What does that mean? Our enterprise system of Workday, you can't get into it right now and effectively pull up. Like I can't ask Jim or Mark or Mary, pull up your expenses and your revenue on a daily basis. All of us have been in systems where I served, and I could come in on a Monday morning and a Friday afternoon, it was, it was almost a, a, a ritual. I would pull it up, I would look at it, and I could look at how we were doing as a large and diverse department. And it informs the communication and the planning. And Leslie said, we don't have that in place yet, so we really can't do that. She also recognized that the implementation of the budget model would not be effective in part because they were trying to hold everybody harmless. Okay, so sit with it for a minute, and I'm sorry to, to whip the deceased equine here, but I'll just stay with this for a minute. Think about the fact that we're, we're having budget reductions, but we're going to hold everybody harmless. You cannot do those two things. For that model to be implemented, you would have had to have made decisions about your priorities, what we will no longer do and what we will continue to do. This does give me an opportunity to say something. President Schultz and others have said that the health sciences is a priority. 
But we need to also see that in terms of some of the resourcing and the funding that would come to the health sciences, and we are not in that place yet. So what Leslie said is we're going to put a hold on this hybrid RCM model. We will work to get our reporting uh, taken care of to actually implement the, the workday reporting so that we understand what our expenditures and our revenues are. And we will start with the core funds. And the core funds are made from state allocations and from the, um, the tuition dollars. We have about a $1.2 billion a year uh, budget for the institution. Approximately 50% of that, maybe a little bit more, is the state allocation for operations and the tuition dollars. So again, approximately $300 million each for those. Uh, the tuition is actually down, and this is what makes this really difficult, because the institution had a high watermark of over 30,000 students. We're now at 26,000. How we arrived at this place is because we saw a decline in the student enrollments and we graduated the biggest classes that we've had in our history. We're now on an uptick, but the impacts, whether it be with the tuition dollars or even with athletics, are real for our system. So where are we with the budget model? Um, Leslie is uh, working across the system to get the reporting done. There's another thing that, that happened, and we received a question about my roles and um, about how I would do those, but maybe it gives me an opportunity to just say, the appointment as a vice president really, we hope, will enable us having um, a voice in how the budget is planned, implemented, and executed. That voice hasn't been there as much before. It's been uh, the deans having some voice, the chancellor having a voice, but uh, it has not as been a strong, as strong a voice. So there are now three executive vice presidents and the president. And um, the plan is that they would have kind of the, the final approval for the budget activities across um, the system. Next thing is we will actually begin again a budget process. It's going to be messy in the first year or two because we don't know what will come out of that, but um, we will be implementing that. And we're working with uh, EVP Leslie Bernelli, which many of you know, she has chosen to, to have an office here in this building, and we think that that's a good thing. It gives us an opportunity to interact with her. Okay, so you previewed this question, but I'll read it for the group. Do you consider being both Chancellor of Spokane and the EVP of the Health Sciences to impact your ability to best serve the Spokane campus based on what our needs are here on this campus? In the future, no. So this is a transitional uh, dual hat role. So I um, started here in the May and June of 2017. I was still a dean and I was um, three up and three down for about, actually for about six months. I started officially as a chancellor um, in September of 17, but I was also instructed that I would continue to serve as a dean until the end of that calendar year. So I was a chancellor, and at that time, uh, the chancellor did not have authority or responsibility. There was not a reporting structure with the deans. The deans reported to the provost um, on the Pullman campus. In many ways, that was effective. In many ways, that was not effective. So in the summer of 2019, President Schultz created the first vice president for health sciences role. So then it was a chancellor and the vice president for health sciences. Um, I've had numerous conversations, including saying that I think these roles need to be split. But I've been asked for the, for the foreseeable future that we would keep these roles together. What you've heard today is that the deans, we all bear responsibility for the operations that occur here on this campus, but each one of them are the ultimate responsible authority for the programs that are on the other campuses because those programs emanate from a college 
and we're responsible to support those colleges at those different sites. And that's why the vice president role was designed to support the colleges. Next is what I already touched on is the opportunity to have voice in regard to the budget model planning and the, um, the implementation. One of the things that has happened is President Schultz has asked all of us to develop a health professional uh, student, excuse me, health, a health sciences advisory council. And that health sciences advisory council is Mary Coithen, Jim Record, Mark Lead, Dory Borgeson, Wendy Powers, is Celestina Barbosa Liker and myself. And that council is really to look at the operations in the health sciences institutionally and then what we can do together to build sustainably. So he is instructed that we do this, we get together. It's actually very lively. It allows for the deans to, to share some of their concerns, but also more important than that, to plan for how we, we might work together. So that's why kind of this EVP role, Dean Borgeson, Dean Powers don't report to me, but we, we work together pretty closely. So that's kind of a transition that you've seen. Do the roles need to be split in the future? Probably so, but for right now, we'll keep them together. Okay, thank you, Daryl. Um, we're gonna open up for a few questions for the audience. We've got about 10-ish minutes. Um, and yeah, perfect. So what I'll have you do is introduce yourself um, for folks who might not know who you are and what your unit or college you're with, um, and then your question um, in the mic so that we can catch it on camera. Thank you. Hi, uh, Layla Harrison, Vice Dean for Admission Student Affairs and Alumni Engagement for the College of Medicine. Um, thank you for all the information. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was nationally we're seeing an increase in students seeking accommodations in the health professions, which is a great thing. Um, I'm hoping that means because we're talking about it more, they're feeling more comfortable coming forward. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, we obviously know that there's been challenges at the campus level in supporting mm -hmm. students who need accommodations, um, and especially for the health sciences colleges where many of us, uh, it doesn't end here. They, um, you know, how they perform in medical school, on board exams and so on, predict um, the next phase of their, their postgraduate training. Um, it's, it's critical for that, and accommodations is part of that. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are um, um, in terms of that for this campus, but also how do we um, impress upon the larger university that we can't always rely on Pullman services that we may need our own robust services present here yeah so <clears throat> dr. Harrison a very so this is a very complex situation that is changing and I might ask Peter to speak into this but this is where um, there's pain points in terms of the coordination of how we support the colleges and those pain points provide us some opportunities. So the complexity of supporting the students who um, are requesting accommodations, how that, that connects to your curriculum and how that supports your curriculum but doesn't create additional challenges, uh, burdens for the student or costs for uh, the colleges is something that we're serious about. We're committed to working with uh, all of the colleges on um, and uh, we would like to see improved. I am still in discovery process in regard to understanding a lot of the complexities of this. So please keep strong voice about what we need to be aware of, how we can change. It's part of what we've, we've got a, a strong team uh, to help support, but we are also uh, going to need to partner with you more effectively in some spaces. I will tell you that um, in, in this area, we will probably need to um, be the lead in, in regard to we're, we're not going to be able to rely on the, the services that uh, Pullman will provide. So uh, Peter, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, so. Dr. Harrison, thank you for asking. This is an important question and one we need to do better on. 
So thank you, Chancellor. Uh, we have had... Uh, introduce yourself, please. Peter Gittau, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. <laughs> um, so I, I share your pain in, in, in this particular issue because we've had, I think, three failed attempts to recruit uh, someone in that position. Uh, we've modified that position a few times <clears throat> just to make sure that it is more attractive. Right now, we are in another stage of looking at candidates who have applied for that, and so we continue to fish and fish and fish. Uh, people need to understand that folks don't go to college and get a major in, in, in accommodations. Uh, it, it's a skill that sometimes you get through experience, you work through it, and so we need to have a degree of patience that we may not get someone uh, as a finalist who is, not, who is not necessarily very proficient in health sciences, but someone who might grow into that role, okay? And so if we do that, there will be moments and, uh, of transition and training. Uh, it is possible to grow your own, and that's one of the things that we are frankly looking at, uh, because when you get someone who is a seasoned accommodations professional, especially from a health sciences background, then the salary requirements are way above what we are able to provide here. So I'm just kind of laying out some of the challenges we have. Uh, I feel very positive that we are getting some candidates that could work out. Now, might they be able to hit the ground running and do exactly what we want them to do? That might be a challenge. And so the patients you might have is how do we work with them? How do we afford them the training um, so that they become really what we want them to be? And Layla, you point out something that's very important. There are other areas. So um, student health services are very important, and we are not sufficiently staffed and, and able to provide those, whether those are mental health and counseling services or they are other health services. And we need to probably um, uh, plow our own uh, furrow in this one. So we're, we're going to be relying on voices, yours included, in terms of how we'll do that in the future. Yep. Other questions? Other questions? Hi, Dr. DeWald. My name is Jennifer Westfall, and I'm a student here at WSU Spokane. I'm a senior in the Nutrition and Exercise Physiology program. Yes. And I really appreciate you being here, um, offering this to be open to students and be in discussion with us, not just about our achievements, but also some of the challenges we face. Um, my question as a student in the NEP program is what efforts are being made to bring NEP and speech and hearing sciences into the spotlight and into the discussion? Um, we are part of the College of Medicine. Um, the conversation about the College of Medicine is full, usually solely focused on the medical school. Yeah. As a student, I feel like when we are left out of discussions like the one today, mm -hmm. it impacts our ability to grow and have our own achievements. But also as a student, it makes us feel unseen and devalued. Yeah. And um, thank you. And you're right. And I'm sorry. I should have um, talked about this. This wasn't comprehensive coverage. And I apologize. Because you should be included in the discussions. And uh, Dr. Record and others um, are we are in uh, conversations about nutrition and exercise physiology and speech and hearing sciences. And um, part of the challenge that he and others have faced, and certainly it's been a challenge uh, for me, is that the institution, the way that we established the previous budgeting model, made it where those programs uh, were not supported by the, um, the central allocation. So we are working hard to figure out how uh, to do that. Literally, um, the College of Medicine, which was a um, not only willing, but an enthusiastic supporter of those programs and stepped up to onboard or to uh, bring the programs in and to help them to grow, they've been um, perennially challenged by the fact that um, I, I don't I don't know how to say it any different, but they they've just not been supported in, in terms of we had a we had a budget model that is called enrollment excuse me enrollment based budgeting and it's just it, it's not an effective budget model, but because of where uh, NEP and 
speech and hearing sciences was, it then made it a uh, responsibility of the college to try to support those pr programs without funding. So we are looking at this really hard to see what we can and cannot do. Thank you. And again, please accept an apology because I bounced across the surface, but recognizing you are a very important part of this college. Hi, Michelle Armstrong, um, co well, Associate Director, SP3 Northwest. Um, so it was great seeing the slide about the funding numbers and the expenditures. I'm really curious about the impact and outcomes. So do those funding numbers, how are those reflected in number of publications, impact of publications? And I know that we've got our first set of doctors that are being employed uh, as independent physicians, but what do those employment numbers look like? Uh, what does the success of our students look like? Yeah, so Michelle, great questions bundled all in one. We don't currently have the ability to track and report up all of those because we don't, we don't have a, a common database that captures uh, not only the publications, but then the impact of the, the publications and the grants. So this is just one isolated example pulled. The funding is often used as a, a measure of success, but it really is the, the publications and their impact. And what I can tell you is I can, I can judge that anecdotally uh, by understanding, and some who have evaluated, we're, we're embedded in the evaluation of our faculty. We have amazing faculty. They are um, highly active in terms of their publication records, their training of students. So in that area, We've got to figure out how to measure it and how to bring that data to bear as well. We don't want to devolve back into what's your H index and do you, do you put it on your shoulder and so on, but we do need to understand um, how those publications impact. We try to highlight that, but again, we kind of touch the surface on that, both with what the colleges do, and they're very good about putting forward some of those research successes, and we try to capture that as well but we don't fully capture the impact. In terms of the health professionals out, um, already out and about, and, and I've said this and I, and I get some input and, and some cautions about this, but if you think about our health professionals going out and they touch a thousand lives and we, we have thousands of the Coug nurses, Coug pharmacists out there we will have in 10 years a thousand Coug docs out there. If they just touch a thousand lives each, they're going to touch a million people. If more accurately represented, they touch thousands of lives. And many of the, the docs will, will, well, the nurses as well, and then the pharmacists, I can't judge, but I would say they will touch several thousand lives. They're touching. These, these graduates, these learners, these health professionals are affecting millions of lives. So that's an impact that is pretty clear to us. It's hard to measure that because that happens over a career, but that's what the investment yields in those individuals because they've committed to these, these challenging careers and they, they alone will touch thousands of lives. But we don't measure it well. We need to. We're committed to doing that. Thank you, Chancellor DeWald. I think given time, because I imagine we've got folks that need to hop into meetings, we'll wrap things up. But thank you so much. If there's other questions you have, feel free to email me or Chancellor DeWald directly, and we can work through those if needed. Um, and then, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.